Here's an episode of How to Analyse Poetry from The Learning Cauldron. Today we'll be looking at Liz Lochhead's poem, My Rival's House. Analyzing poetry involves identifying and dissecting the literary techniques that the poet has used effectively to explore the theme or themes of a poem. In her poem, My Rival's House, Liz Lochhead explores the themes of conflict and rivalry, female relationships and family relationships. The title of the poem, My Rival's House, immediately introduces the first-person voice, the persona in the poem, and also the word choice of rival. Here there's a suggestion straight from the start that two individuals are competing for some object, and it turns out to actually be a person rather than an object. It's immediately suggesting a poor relationship between the two women involved right from the start. What's also interesting to note is that there is an enjambment from the title right into the first line of the first stanza, and that takes us straight into the house, which is mentioned in the title. The word choice of surfaces here immediately brings to the reader's attention the idea of superficiality. There's a fake friendliness, perhaps, or suggesting the house is trying to be something that it actually isn't. Here, references to ormulu and guilt both suggest that although something appears to be gold in colour, it isn't actually gold. Again, this idea of of the surface not necessarily being the real thing. The use of sibilance here with slipper, satin and lush helps to convey the idea of luxury, luxuriousness of the fittings here in the house. And velvet also is a luxury material. Yet in spite of all this, we're told that the cushions are so stiff you can't sink in. And this suggests a feeling of discomfort and almost tension. You can't actually feel comfortable in this house. In this line, the final line of this first stanza, the word choice of distortions is also worthy of note. Distortion suggests that something is not quite what it appears to be, all adding to the whole mood that's been created so far in this stanza. The second stanza opens with the use of the first person plural pronoun, we, and immediately that begs the question, who? Who is the we of this poem? And it transpires later that it is the persona of the poem and her partner, who is the son of the hostess of the house. One gets the feeling that they're almost entering a temple here. They take their shoes off at her door, shuffle stuff stocking sold, and the sibilance helps to create almost the sound of them shuffling along the floor. They are on tiptoe, which suggests they're treading very carefully in this place. The word choice of parquet refers to another luxury fitting, a type of wooden floor, and again there's a reference to surface, and you'll see there's another one later on, which again refers to the superficiality of this household. Everything has to look good, but who knows what's underneath. Everything also has to be protected, and this makes us think that if the hostess of the house has to protect everything in her house, all the objects, what will she do? when it comes to protecting her son. And this hints at the rivalry between the two women. The reference here to dust, cover, drawn, shade shows the lengths to which this woman will go to protect things. And the word choice of shade suggests darkness here. She is obsessive in her wish to protect. Stanza three opens with sibilance. Silver sugar tongs and silver salver. The repetition of silver hints at the pretentiousness of the hostess and somehow the sibilance creates a slightly sinister tone as well. In the next line, the reference to my rival reminds us of the title My Rival's House. This is the hostess and she serves us tea, which seems a fairly pleasant thing to do. Yet we don't get a good vibe from this woman. She glosses over him and me. The glosses suggests again superficiality and the persona says I am all edges, a surface, a shell. And this hints at her feelings of fragility and vulnerability. She's vulnerable like an eggshell that could break and the all edges emphasises her feeling of discomfort. This is not a comfortable household. The sound technique of sibilance continues in this line with squirms beneath her surface. The word choice of squirms is particularly effective here because it suggests there's something really quite unpleasant going on and that a darkness lurks within this hostess. The repetition of my rival here reminds us that there is some sort of contest going on, although we're not quite sure of the exact nature of it yet. And this is a very effective use of words here. It's a play on words. The phrase fight tooth and nail means to really throw everything into a fight or a battle. And this highlights how the persona feels threatened by the other woman, the hostess. Another interesting point to note here is the use of the word capped to describe the tooth, which suggests there's a surface on top of it, and polished to describe the nail, which is nail polish on top of the nail. So we're seeing here again the idea of surfaces concealing something below. The persona fears that the hostess will fight, 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 for her survival in this contest. And the 
the use of the F alliteration here really adds impetus to the feeling of a desperate battle. The use of sound continues in the next line with the alliteration of the harsh D sound in deferential daughterly, which suggests that the persona is struggling to maintain her composure as she sips the tea that she's been given. We also have a hint here of the relationship between the two women. Daughterly suggests this is perhaps a prospective daughter-in-law, although we don't quite know for sure, but certainly it's a clue. The word choice of nicely is interesting here because the persona is not feeling very comfortable here and yet she is trying to conceal her true thoughts, which is exactly what the other lady is doing as well, so that's interesting. She's trying to give the impression that all is well, yet the short clipped P sound, sip and cup, suggests that the taste of this tea is unpalatable, hence the word choice of bitter. Stanza 4 starts with the word and, conveying a sense of continuation and a building of the tension. The persona says that she has a lot to thank this woman, the hostess, for, and there's a slightly ironic tone here. This son, and now we have it, confirmation of the actual relationship. The hostess's son is the boyfriend of the persona. And here the use of parenthesis emphasises how important that is, because he is first blood to her. In other words, the relationship between him and his mother is always going to be closer technically than between him and his girlfriend. The persona. There's also another meaning of first blood, which is to win the first point in a competition, which is quite an interesting one given the rivalry that is one of the themes of the poem. The use of structure, repetition, is quite effective here as well, with never, never. There's a feeling of real finality here, as if no matter what she does, she cannot win here because the man can never be free from the family ties that bind him. And there's a fabulous use of imagery here with sour potluck of family. The most frequent use of potluck is a potluck supper where you bring along dishes and you just get what people bring. So it's the idea that you can't really control your family members. And the idea that this dish is sour certainly adds to the feeling of unease and discomfort that the persona is feeling here. And used again here to keep the poem moving on and how close this family that furnishes the use of alliteration to emphasise that. Furnishes is an interesting choice here because family are people and yet they're almost being looked upon as objects that might furnish a house here. It's as if the family members are the belonging of the hostess. And finally, another reference to my rival, which keeps us focused on this struggle, this contest that is going on so subliminally in the house. Stanza 5 opens powerfully with two short minor sentences, lady of the house and then the imagery of queen bee. These help to create an impression of the rival, the hostess, as being grand, self-important. She's obviously someone who considers herself superior and she's the matriarch, the strong female figure of this family. Also with the imagery of the bee, she has a sting. The repetition of she occurs several times here over this stanza and the next, emphasising the fact that the rival is becoming more and more intimidating to the persona. Repetition of far more unconscious, far more dangerous also builds the suspense as to whether or not this woman is going to win the contest. Unconscious suggests is going to be easy for her, she's devious, she does it without even trying. Dangerous is quite sinister. Here the persona addresses the reader, listen, she says, I was always my own worst enemy. And this is a step up from rival. Enemy is stronger. She, that is the hostess, has taken even this from me. Now this is a very wry, humorous statement here, but it shows how much the woman is feeling intimidated. She can't even be her own worst enemy. The rival is able to even beat her at that. There's a sense of hopelessness developing here. In stanza six, sound is used effectively once again, with the alliteration of the harsh D sound in dishes up her dreams for breakfast. This use of imagery here is very effective and it picks up on the food imagery earlier on with sour pot luck. At dinner her salt tears and the word choice here suggests that the woman, the hostess, is actually sorrowful at the fact that she's having to share her son. The short staccato P sound in pepper our soup adds to the impression of the, the tears dropping into the soup, but although this is actually imagery here. The last two lines of this poem are particularly powerful. She won't, and then a fabulous enjambment emphasising the won't, and then give up. We get a feeling of the relentlessness, it's like a war of attrition that this rival is mounting and we get the impression that the persona fears the rival will win because she is so persistent and she will not be beaten. Interestingly, on the BBC Bite Size resources, which are well worth checking out if you haven't already, they refer to the clipped, blunt style of this poem and the fact that it sounds almost in places like, for example, the sip and cup and here she won't give up as if this is being spoken through gritted teeth, conveying the sense 
sense of frustration and tension in the persona. With regard to the structure and form of this poem, although the poem is written in free verse, there is a rhyme scheme in that the last two lines of each stanza apart from the last one end in full or half rhyme. This helps to mark the changes as she looks at different aspects of this situation. As far as tone is concerned, there are various tones in the poem. It ranges from tense and apprehensive to threatening. It's briefly ironic and humorous at points, and there is definitely an underlying sinister feel at other points, eventually ending up in a resigned tone. I hope that's been helpful. See you next time. In other videos, we analyse more of Liz Lochhead's poems. If you found this or any of our other videos useful, it would be great if you could subscribe to the YouTube channel. Thanks for your support.